but we, we've come down. We've talked about all of these eminent um, masters in Chinese Zen and, um, and talked about the fact that Zen really didn't get that name until it, there wasn't a meditation school separate within Buddhism until China. Um, there were certainly schools that did meditation and that it was important to. And we get down uh, to Lin Chi. And Zen had, had started to have this particular flavor that it had. You would recognize it. If you were back there and you understood the Chinese, you would know that you were seeing Zen take place because um, discussions was not the norm. You didn't have monks sitting around talking about, well, what did the Buddha mean? You didn't have lengthy things like that. You, you still had masters giving talks, but the talks tended to become shorter and shorter. Uh, in contrast to what was going on in the Pure Land School, where masters would give long, long days and days and days of talks on sutras. Like when the Sixth Patriarch uh, finally came out of the woods and went to the temple. Well, there was a master there, and he was expounding on uh, one of the sutras, and it was at least a week that he was talking. And that still takes place in Buddhist countries, that masters will go into a temple and they will talk. The difference is, in an American situation, it wouldn't be unusual for the master, say, to talk for an hour and a half every day for seven days. Okay, even at Zen temples, that kind of thing happens, and then the rest of the the rigmarole takes place. You get some meditation. You might get to see the master. You might help clean up the place and have the meals and get the flavor of it. In those days, and in Pure Land schools today in the Orient, if you went to a seven day lecture, there would be eight hours of lecture a day, and people would just sit there and be talked at. That's a lot of talking. It's a lot of talking for the teacher, and it's a lot of talking for people to try to absorb. And so we, we come down to Lin Chi. He had this extraordinary master, Huang Po, that uh, kind of set him in the mold for how he was gonna how he was gonna function. And Lin Chi is known uh, for not saying a whole lot of anything. Lin Chi came out one day, and he had his hosu. And a hosu is a whisk. And the Africans still use them. At least you can buy them in, in uh, Pure One Imports. you know. And they're uh, a hair. Originally, they were a horsehair whisk. And they became a symbol. The monks used them in India to, to brush away the mosquitoes and the flies because, of course, they couldn't take the life. And they became this, this symbol of compassion. And then they became attached to, because they were a compassion symbol, to Avalokiteshvara or Kuan Yin. Um, and so you never see her with one, but it's always associated with her one because it's great compassion of not killing the animal, but just brushing it off your body. So it now becomes a liturgical implement. And so you, you generally find, um, in the beginning, abbots all had them. And then as time went by, they started being reserved for Zen masters. Uh, it became their, a bit of their symbol of, at least in our school, their, their symbol of being a Zen master, that they would carry this symbol of compassion. It became very common that when the, the master would come out, he'd have one or two things, or both, that he would bring out. He would bring his symbol of office. He would, he would bring his monk staff, which... Most monks had, but in some places, uh, the the abbot or the master would have a, a very nice staff that you know someone had picked a, a nice looking piece of wood, and maybe put a little oil or finish on it, and he would use that during his talks. And this is the stick people usually get hit with <laughs> is that staff, and he would have his hosu, and so. Lin Chi comes out one day in the Dharma Hall, arrives in the Dharma Hall, and sits down at his seat. And he, he looked at the assembly. All the monks were standing, uh, waiting for the teacher to talk. And that was the tradition then. They didn't sit in the Dharma Hall. And he raises his hosu up. Now, these old guys, you know if they've got something in their hands, they're kind of going to use it for emphasis, right? Kind of like if Italians, this thing's going to be flying around. But he just raises it up and shows it to everyone. And then he gets up and walks out. And, you know, everybody goes, well, what was that? And it puts me in mind, 
and it may maybe he was in mind at the time of um, Shakyamuni Buddha coming out and raising a flower and showing it to the assembly, and then it's done. Okay, with Shakyamuni Buddha, there there are a number of accounts of this occasion. Some say that afterwards he went into this long exposition talking about Mahakashapa as having his his dharma and all this kind of stuff. There's also a story that says he came out, raised the flower, Mahakashapa sh- smiled, he smiled back at him, got up and left. And uh, if we're going to say that Zen came from the historical Buddha, I think that's probably the real story. I think afterwards people started writing down an explanation of what took place. And then somebody folded that end of the Buddha explaining it. I don't think at that moment the Buddha felt there was any reason to explain. Mahakashapa understood. It's like telling a joke. If you have to explain it, nobody's going to laugh. If you have to explain what just took place, nobody's got it anyway. 